leaders, I said, praise the Lord. The Lord bless you. And the Lord make you to advance this year in Jesus' name. Your goals, your plans, your ideals, and the place you are looking forward to in ministry and in life. The Lord will fulfill it for every one of us. You will not fail. You will not backslide. Amen. And the work will prosper in your hands in Jesus' name. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this evening. We thank you, Lord, for the calling you have given us. And we thank you for your power, your strength, your anointing upon every life. We're asking this year, Lord, will prosper in your work more than ever before in Jesus' name. Everything we need to move forward, to grow up, to advance in the work of the Lord, grant to everyone. Our pray, Lord, will not be tired, will not be weak or weary, will not look back, will keep on moving forward every time in Jesus' name. We'll see the progress we have never seen in ministry. Accomplish it in every life. In Jesus' mighty name we we'll pray. God bless you. You can sit down. I told you last week that we are following a series of studies and a series of messages in our Tuesday Leadership Development. And today we're looking at advancing towards higher productive leadership. It's good to be a leader, but it's not good to just occupy the position as a leader. We need to understand why God has raised us up, what he wants us to do, what he wants us to accomplish, and then to grow in that, to be productive, and to go higher in our productivity in leadership. That means we advance. That means we move on. That means we are increasing every time. So tonight we're looking at advancing towards higher productive leadership. In John chapter 15, I read from verse 1. John 15, reading from verse 1. I am the true vine, and my father is the husband man. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it may bear, it may bring forth more fruit. Underline that in your Bible, and I pray that that will be fulfilled in your life this year and henceforth in Jesus' name. The Lord purchased so that you will bring forth more fruit. Verse 4, abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, and ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, ye can do nothing. With him, you can do everything. With him, all things are possible for you. But without him, we can do nothing. But seven, if ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. A good amen there. Herein is my Father glorified, that she bear much fruit. Herein is the Father, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and your own Father. Herein is our Father glorified, that she bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. As I said, we're looking at the message tonight, advancing towards higher 
productive leadership. There are three things we're looking at. Number one, abiding in his strength for productive leadership. If we're going to be a fruit, if we're going to be a more fruit, if we're going to be a much fruit, we need his strength. And we need his uh, power. And we need his understanding. And we need more of his grace. And we need to abide in that strength for productive leadership. Point number two. Admonition from the steadfastness of past leaders. As we look at the scriptures, we'll find there are people who have led the flock of God. They have led the fold of God. They have led the congregations of God. They have led the church of the living God. Whether in the Old Testament or in the New Testament, we have these wonderful examples and we have admonition from them. How did they make it? How did they do it? They were steadfast and the same God who was with them, that same God will be with you. And the same grace they receive, that same grace you will receive in Jesus' name. We have admonition from them, from the steadfastness of past leaders. Point number three, awakening the spirit of passive leaders. We don't um, trample upon passive leaders, their leaders. God has raised them up and they do not know their leaders. Or maybe we've given signal to them and the signal appears to say, who needs you? Who wants you? Why are you there? What are you doing? Get out of the way. We can do everything by ourselves. And that attitude of those who are strong, that attitude of those who are militant, that attitude of those who want to do everything by themselves has discouraged other leaders. And those leaders are now passive. If you are like that, I pray God will awaken your spirit will quicken your spirit. And all the Lord wants you to do, you will do. And you will excel in Jesus' name. Awakening the spirit of passive leaders. We're coming to number one. Tell me number one on your side over there. Abiding in a strength for productive leadership. Uh, let's come back to John chapter 15. In John chapter 15, verse 2, Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he the Father taketh away. I pray the Father will not take you away. You will bear fruit. Expected fruit. And exceedingly a great fruit where will be in Jesus' name. And then he says, Every branch that beareth fruit, Every branch that beareth fruit, a man, a woman, woman leader, or adult church leader, or youth leader, every branch or campus church leader, or the children church leader, or the language church leader, every branch, he loves every one of us, and he has put us in place, and he wants us to bear fruit, and whatever areas or section you are in, in the work of the Lord, the Lord is expecting fruit. He will see the fruit is expecting in Jesus' name. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it. But why? It's already bearing fruit. And why will God purge a branch that is bearing fruit? There are some other sticks or some other branches or some other parasites that hang on those branches. And they will be sapping the nutrient out of that uh, fruit bearing branch. And so the Lord will cut them off. Anything that will hinder you from bearing fruit, the Lord will purge the Lord will take away so that there will be no parasite in your life. There will be no parasite in your ministry. There will be no parasite in your faithfulness that will be taking away all that you are learning and the grace you have and the strength you have and the vision you have. No parasite will abide in your life or family or ministry in Jesus' name. The Lord will perch so that you'll bear more fruit. And then he goes on to say in verse 8, 
It says in verse 8, Herein is my Father glorified, that she bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. It says the evidence of being a disciple of Christ, the evidence that was still attached to him, were connected with him, and were following him, and were abiding in him, is that we're bearing fruit, much fruit. Look at verse 15. Henceforth, I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I call you friends, for all the things that I have heard of my Father have I made known unto you. Ye, are not, ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit. You should go. Go to your community and bring forth fruit. Go to your district and bring forth fruit. Go to that section where you are and fulfill the reason for your calling. <clears throat> and the reason for your calling is that you will bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. Your fruit will abide. Your fruit will remain. It says that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. He will give it to you. We abide in him, abiding in his strength for productive leadership. In First John chapter 2, First John chapter 2, he wants us to abide. Because it's in abiding that the grace of God will be flowing into our lives. It's in abiding that the strength of the Lord more and more will be flowing into our lives. It's in abiding that all the anointing we need, all the strength we need, all the power we need will be flowing into our lives. I will abide. You will abide. Each of us will abide in the Lord in Jesus' name. First John chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 6. He that says he abideth in him ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. We understand the meaning of this for a believer that he is here to live a righteous life, a holy life, a pure life, a consecrated life, a life that is separated from the world or from worldliness. But now come and read that verse again with the understanding of a disciple is sent out to work. It says, He that abideth in him ought himself also so to walk, even as he walked. How did he walk? He evangelized. He preached the word, he healed the sick, he counseled people, he led them to eternal life and to salvation. And if we say we abide in him as a minister, abiding in the steps of the master, we evangelize, we edify the church, we make the church to grow forward. And as he loves the sinners, we love the sinners. And as he wants to come call them, gather them into the kingdom. We want to do the same thing as well. Look at verse 14. In verse 14 it says, I'm reaching unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I have reaching unto you, young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you. And ye have overcome you have overcome the wicked one. You'll be an overcomer. You'll overcome the wicked one in Jesus' name. Who is an overcomer? Somebody who doesn't run away from the field because the wicked one is there on the field. Because Satan is there on the field. Because persecutors are there on the field. Because opposers are there on the field. And because those who will contradict him are there on the field. If you abide in him and his word abides in you, you will not run away from the field because of Satan, because of evil spirit, because of persecutors, because of danger, and because of any difficulty. You will abide in the Lord. 
I said, you'll abide in the Lord. He says, you abide in him and you are strong. Look at verse 24. In verse 24, it tells us very clearly, Let that therefore abide in you, which ye have heard from the beginning. What did you hear from the beginning? Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. What did you hear from the beginning? Teaching them all things whatsoever I have commanded you. What a minister had had from the beginning. What a leader had had from the beginning. What a soul winner has had from the beginning. The minister should not always interpret the Bible at the primary level. At the level of ordinary believers. That's the problem with many leaders. It's like a professor in a university. Every time he hears something, you know, he goes back to his primary school days. And he wants to carry out whatever he's hearing like he's still in the primary school. You're no more in the primary school. You're a minister. If you're a minister, what you have heard from the beginning when you became a minister... When you became a leader, when you became a preacher, you will carry that thing out. Let that therefore abide in you, which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. You will continue. We're looking at, um, looking at uh, First John chapter 3. First John chapter 3, we're looking at verse 4. Whosoever committeth sin transgresses also the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. Again, please understand, sin is the transgression of the law. What law? We're not only thinking of don't steal, don't commit adultery. Thank God you will not steal. And thank God you will not commit adultery. But do you remember the word of God? He that knows to do good and doeth it not to him, it is sin. You know the law of God. Love your neighbor as yourself. All those who are perishing, all those who are going astray, you know the word of God. And you know what Christ would have done if Christ were here. I came to seek and to save that which was lost. If you close your mouth, if you close your eyes, if you fold your hand, if you do not talk to sinners and you know what to tell them, that they ought to be saved, they ought to repent, they ought to come to the Lord. If you don't do it to him that knows to do good and does not do it to him, it is sin. I'm sure you remember the word of God that says, whatsoever is not of faith is sin. If you know the way of faith, how to walk by faith, how to stand by faith, how to live by faith, faith in Christ. And you do not live by faith in Christ. You know the right thing, that we're not walking by sight, we're walking by faith. If you go back then, if you look back then, and now you're walking by sight, you walk as carnal people walk, and you walk as ordinary people walk, you don't realize you're a minister. You don't realize that God has called you for something important and eternal for the kingdom of God, walking as carnal men. That's sin for a minister. It tells us in verse 5, And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth has not seen him, neither known him. It's telling us the evidence we abide in the Lord is that the scripture abides in us, the spirit abides in us, and the soul winning commission abides in us. Look at that chapter 3 verse 24. Chapter 3 verse 24. He that keepeth his commandments dwelleth in him, and he in him, and hereby we know that he abideth in us by the Spirit which he has given us. He has given us the Spirit, whereat the Spirit at conversion, 
And then when we became sanctified, we had more of the Spirit of God. For the Comforter is with you and shall be in you as we now plunge into the grace of God and all the provision of God, the promise unto you and to your children, to many that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Then we're baptized in the Holy Ghost, and uh, the Spirit of God abides much, much more in us, abiding in His strength. will abide in His strength. will abide in His strength. You know, when we're buying in the strength, you'll not say, well, I'm weak now, I'm tired now, I'm fainting now, uh, the work is too much than I can bear, I'm discouraged, I'm this, I'm that. No, courage will come, boldness will come, authority will come, and you will have a strong persuasion and the drive from within because you are abiding in the strength of the Lord and you'll be a productive leader in Jesus' name. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. If anybody needed that verse, it's the minister. If anybody needs a verse like this, it's the preacher. If anybody needs a verse like this, it's somebody that has a body, has a load to carry, has a work to do. And that work is so much that its natural strength, its natural earthly ability cannot take it through, cannot carry it through. And so the Lord is telling us through the Apostle Paul, finally, my brethren, fellow ministers, finally my brethren, fellow workers, finally my brethren, the people who have accepted the covenant as well as the commission the Lord has given us, finally my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, put on the whole armor of God, that she may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. You will stand. As we go to the field and as we preach the gospel, there may be the strategies of the devil to derail us, to discourage us, and to push us down, and to make us not to have the backbone or the strength or the courage to continue, but all those wiles of the devil, everyone without exception, you will stand against them. They will not destroy you. They will not destroy your confidence. They will not destroy uh, your consecration in Jesus' name. But we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. We wrestle. Somebody say, we wrestle. Uh, you know, there are so-called ministers and pastors, and they are called workers. They do not know that we wrestle. And if there is any opposition, if there is any distraction, if there is anything, they, they stand there and they say, but why? Why? I'm doing the best I can do. And I have the consecration I ought to have. And I want to follow after the Lord. And I want to bear fruit. And this year I consecrated my life to the Lord. And I said, I'm going to do something great, greater than I ever did. And now look at this one. And they stay there. And they fold their hands and the principalities and powers are wrestling against them. Such people that, you know, are just wondering why you'll be defeated because you're not even making any effort to wrestle against all those principalities and powers. Principalities, when you take that word, uh, the first part of it is principle. All the principles of power, all the principles of the paths of darkness, and rulers, principles, rulers, of the darkness of this world, they come to wrestle against you. You have the name of Jesus. You have the power of the Spirit. You have the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And you have the Word, and you can say it is reaching. You will overcome every one of them in Jesus' name. But you must wrestle. 
but you must do something active and something positive. Look at verse 13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand, you will stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, above all, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Can you? Will you be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked? I'm asking you a question. You know, that there are people that say that, you know, the, the devil now is more clever than he was 10 years ago. The demons are more terrible than they were 20 years ago. They say, when I became a Christian and when I went out to witness, the people paid attention. If I gave a tract, they accepted. If I explained a tract, they accepted. If I invited them to church, they accepted. If I invited them to a crusade, they accepted. But you know, the sinners of nowadays... You know, the devil of today, because he knows his time is very short, is fighting with every sin and every weapon. And when you go now, it's like you're speaking to a standing wall. But it says, you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Let me read it for myself. I will be able. I will be able. I will be able. Those demons may come higher, I am able. And the devil may have a stronger force, I am able. And the devil may come from another corner, I wasn't expecting. Any corner he comes from, I'm able to defeat him. I can't hear you for yourself. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. I see overcomers before me. I see conquerors before me. You will overcome. And you will conquer. And it says, and take the shield and take the helmet of salvation. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. I'm praying always. I'm praying always. I'm praying always. You know, sometimes the pe people say, I don't know how to pray. You know how to pray. You know, just a little sentence, God, help me. That is prayer. It will help you. Peter was walking on the water. And then there was this storm that came. And when he began to look at the storm, he began to sink. He didn't have a chance to close his eyes. He didn't have a chance to kneel down. He didn't have a chance to, you know, pray, long prayer. Lord, save me. That was great prayer. And when you pray like that, Lord, save me. Only three words, the mighty hand of God will come from heaven. It will save you in Jesus' name. If you find yourself getting weak, if you find yourself getting weary, if you find yourself fainting, and then you say, Lord, strengthen me, the hand of the Lord will come. He will strengthen you in Jesus' name. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. In verse 19, and for me, that utterance may be given unto me. Utterance may be given unto me. That's part of the prayer we pray. Oh Lord, I'm going for this meeting. I'm going for this evangelism. I'm going for this crusade. I'm going for this uh, teaching session. I'm going for this or that. Give me utterance. That as I open my mouth, the word of God will come out and will enrich the lives of the people and sinners will be saved and believers will be sanctified and sanctified believers will be immersed and baptized in the Holy Ghost. God will answer that prayer. This year, you'll see more converts in your ministry. 
you see more believers sanctified in your ministry. And you will see more of the children of God who are thirsty and who are panting. After the best of God, you'll find them being baptized in the Holy Ghost in your ministry in Jesus' name. And then it says that I may open my mouth with boldly. I may open my mouth boldly. There are people who are naturally timid, naturally they are drawn back, naturally they do not have self-confidence. But you know, when you have the Holy Ghost, the Holy Ghost will bypass your self-confidence or lack of self-confidence, you'll be bold. You'll be courageous. Before Goliath, you will be bold and courageous. And before Pharaoh, you'll be bold and courageous. The Lord will give you the spirit of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That when you come before Nebuchadnezzar, and he says, what did I hear? That you say you are not going to bow down to my idol. All of a sudden, boldness and courage from heaven will come into you. And if he decides, who knows what, uh, what mechanism he decides to do. If he decides to throw you into his fire, he'll be surprised. All his servants are put into that fire, they'll be burnt and they'll be killed. But you will go through that water. When you go through the water, I'll be with you. When you go through the fire, I'll be with you. And the fire will not burn you in Jesus' name. And if you're like Daniel and they throw you into the lion's den, the lions will not kill you. Because, you know, nothing can kill you until you have totally finished your work here on earth. God has a ministry for you until you finish. All those lions, they roam about for nothing. They will not catch you in Jesus' name. If, if I believe that and somebody else was preaching and I really believe no lion can catch me, I will say amen. Yeah. Look at the 18 verse 19. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. As you ought to speak, you will speak. In the district church, as you ought to speak, you will speak. In any program, as you ought to speak, you will speak. You'll be a productive leader. And the strength of the Lord will abide in you. And you will abide in the strength of the Lord in Jesus' name. I come to point number two now. Admonition from the steadfastness of past leaders. Admonition from the steadfastness of past leaders. I need to remind you of something. That there are people in the Bible that God has written their histories for us. And those histories are supposed to challenge us. They're supposed to inspire us. They're supposed to make us think, what if I want that situation? What could I have done? See the man, see the woman in that situation and see what he's doing. If I ever come to any situation like that, the same grace that that man had, I'm going to have. I say I'm going to have. I said, I am going to have. You will have in Jesus' name. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11. Now, all these things happened unto them for examples. And they are reaching for our admonition. Upon whom the ends of the world are come. Notice that word, admonition. They are reaching for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Come to James chapter 5. We're reading from verses 10 and 11. James chapter 5, reading from verses 10 and 11. Take, my brethren, 
the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord. For an example, it says, study their lives, study their ministries, and see what they have done, and see their steadfastness, and receive admonition, and receive instruction, and receive encouragement, and receive inspiration from their lives. Take my brethren, the prophets, who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering and affliction and of patience, perseverance. Behold, we count them happy, which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job. Ye have heard of the perseverance of Job. And have seen the end of the Lord. The final result of that, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercies. Look at their lives. We're looking at Romans, Romans chapter 15. And I'm reading from verse 4. Romans chapter 15. Here we're looking at verse 4. What's he telling us? Just the same thing I've been telling you that all those examples were reaching so that you will learn from them. You know, sometimes when you have challenge in ministry, difficulties in ministry, and you have accusers in ministry, and you have people that will derail you and distract you in ministry, you think it's never happened to any other person before. Oh, am I so special? And this is happening to me? How can I move on now? How can I reach my goal? You will reach your goal. But you must look at the people that were in the ministry. They were leaders in past generations. See what happened to them. Romans chapter 15 verse 4. For whatsoever things were reaching for time, were reaching for our learning. All the things that are reaching about the leaders of the past, the preachers of the past, and the great men and women of the past, they're reaching for our learning that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. Let's come back to James chapter 5. And I'm reading here from verse 17. James chapter 5. And we're looking at verse 17. It's saying that all these things that were reaching, before this time, about the leaders of the past, they're reaching for our learning so that you and I will have encouragement, you and I will have uh, instruction, you and I will have admonition. In James chapter 5, reading from verse 17, Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. That's Elijah. He lived in the past. He ministered in the past. And the condition of ministry was not rosy, was not convenient, was not comfortable, was not easy. And yet, even though he lived at such a difficult time, and he had a lot of opposition, a lot of people that would have destroyed his ministry, but he couldn't, they would not destroy your ministry. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. And he prayed earnestly. He prayed earnestly. He prayed earnestly. How should I pray? How should you pray? How should leaders pray earnestly? He prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again. And he prayed again, and he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. Now that you have seen that all those leaders of the past, they lived their lives, and they exercised their gifts, and they remained in the ministry, and they were abiding all the time, and they were productive, and they're giving to us as examples. I pray these examples will be reproduced in your life. I'm going to use the word leadership again. L is Levi. Levi. I'm coming to Mark. Coming to Mark chapter 2. In Mark chapter 2, he left a pathway for us. And he left an example for us. You can do that. I can do that too. And these are leaders of the past. 
that we see the way they lived and the way they comported themselves. Mark chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 14. And he passed by, and he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the receipt of custom, and said unto him, Follow me. And he arose, and he followed him. Can I hear one message? And then act on that message immediately. Yes, I can. That's what Levi did. Can I hear a word on consecration and act on it immediately without tossing it up and down, without weighing it pro, I can and pro and crown, I can. That's what Levi did. Can I, without even thinking, without thinking Christ will meet me. And then he's going to call me. All of a sudden, he calls me. And then, without dilly-dallying, without delaying, I rise up and I follow immediately. Yes, I can. How? Levi had the grace. And the grace that was given to him is available for me. It's available for you. And he arose and followed him. And it came to pass that as Jesus sat at meat in his house, many publicans and sinners sat also together with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many, and they followed him. He began evangelism that same day he was called. He began soul winning that same day he was called. He had been a publican. And now he gave his life to the Lord. His name Levi or Matthew. And as he gave his life to the Lord, he called other people. And many of them came and they followed. You are going to invite your friends. You are going to invite your neighbors. You are going to invite the people that are close to you. They will come. Number two is Epaphras. Epaphras. What kind of leader was Epaphras? The kind of leader you ought to be and the kind of leader I ought to be in Colossians chapter 4. Colossians chapter 4. I'm reading from verse 12. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, saluted you, always laboring, no vacation, always laboring, no retiring, always laboring, no taking time off, always laboring fervently, fervently. Anytime you saw a purpose laboring you know, and preaching you know, and doing anything at all for the kingdom of God, it was fervent about it. There was no lukewarmness in him. There was no coldness in him. There was no lethargy in him. There was no drawing back in him. Always laboring fervently for you in prayers that ye may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Imperfection of the people at Colossae did not bother him. He said they must be perfect. All the things that happened to those Colossian people, their confusion, and all the things uh, up and down, he said, I'm laboring fervently. They will be perfect when you come to the church of the living God. You see some inconsistency there, and you see some imperfection there, and you see some corruption there. Does that beat you back, hold you back? What can I do? And why can I labor for these people? You'll be an epaphras there. You'll pray. You'll preach, you'll labor, and the Lord will bring them to perfection in Jesus' name. I was waiting for a good, good amen. Look at Acts chapter 24. I come to Apollos. I come to Apollos now in chapter 24 of Acts. And I'm reading from verse, uh, chapter 18, rather, chapter 18, verse 24. Chapter 18. Verse 24. Look at this man here. It says, And a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures, came to Ephesus. You want to be a leader like this? These are people that have come before us, and you want to see their pattern of life and their pattern of ministry. You read the scriptures. You love the scriptures. You memorize the scriptures. You expound the scriptures. You are mighty in the scriptures. That will take time. 
that will take concentration, that will concentrate on the scriptures. How can you be how can you be a leader? How can you be a preacher of the word of God and not know the word very well? Mighty in the scriptures. Look at verse 25. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit, he didn't have the word in the cold room, in a cold heart. He didn't have the bread of life in the fridge, in a refrigerated heart, but the fervency of spirit. The scripture was there. And the fervency was there. He spake and taught diligently. When he taught, he didn't teach haphazardly. I just put this there, put this there, put this there. And you cannot see the organization of the teaching. He taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto, unto them, and they expounded unto him. The man was humble. And they expanded unto him. The man was teachable. And, and they expanded unto him. The man was receptive. The way of the Lord more perfectly. And when he was disposed to pass to Achaia, the brethren wrote exhorting the disciples to receive him. Who when he was come, he helped them much. He knew the scriptures more now. And he was still fervent. And was still diligent, and he helped the people much which had believed through grace, for he mightily convinced the Jews that and that publicly, showing that by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. We're coming to Daniel. The next letter there is D, and that's Daniel. You know his story. It was thrown, it was thrown into the last day. And in the lion's den, the lion could not eat him up. Why? Well, we know that God sent his angel and preserved him. But apart from that, God had some revelations. God had some great, great revelations of the kingdoms of the earth to reveal through him. And he had some things that he had not reached he had some things he had not revealed, and God had to preserve his life. The Lord will preserve your life. Until you dot every I in your writing, until you cross every T in your writing and revelation, and in your preaching, nothing will destroy your life. The lions of this world will not crack your bone. They will not suck your blood. The lions of this world will not destroy you in Jesus' name. If you have a little headache, don't say the end has come. No, the end cannot come like that. Maybe you need some rest. Maybe you need some sleep. The end will not come until you have ended your ministry. Daniel chapter 6, and I'm reading from verse 22. Daniel Chapter 6, we're reading from verse 22. My God has sent his angel and has shut the lion's mouth that they have not hurt me for as much as before him. Innocency was found in me and also before thee, O king, I have done no hurt. Daniel, what are you saying? He's saying, if you say what is said in the language of the New Testament, I always endeavor to have a conscience void of offense toward God and toward man. Look at that in Acts chapter 24. We're reading from verse 16. That's what Daniel was saying. He said, Before him, I've done no hurt. And before you, king, I've done no hurt. In Acts chapter 24, verse 16. And herein, do I exercise myself to have always a conscious point of offense toward God and toward men. Levi, Epaphras, Apollos, Daniel, Elisha. Elisha was the one that was given to Elijah. And the Lord told Elijah that you will go and anoint Elisha, the son of Shaphan. 
and it will be the prophet in your room. And eventually, when in First Kings chapter 19, First Kings chapter 19, reading from verse, uh, I'm reading from verse 16. And Jehu, the son of Nimshai, shall thou anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, Elisha, the son of Shephat, of Ebel Mehola, shall thou anoint to be prophet in thy room. Look at verse 19. So he departed thence and found Elisha, the son of Shephat, who was plowing with twelve yoke of oxen before him, and he with the twelve. And Elijah passed by and cast his mantle upon him. Now remember, Elijah did not say, Elisha, come. I want to offer you something. Have you heard my story? I'm a great prophet. I look at the mighty things that have happened, and God told me that you will be the one to take my place after I'm gone. He didn't tell him that. He just threw his mantle on him. You remember that mantle? That was the mantle on the day Elijah was to go. He ran together, and then he smote River Jordan, and River Jordan parted. And when this man Elisha had asked for a double portion, he said, you have asked for a hard thing. If you see me when I'm, when I'm going, it will be yours. If not, it will not be yours. And then they went on in the way. And as the chariots of fire came to uh, catch Elijah away, Elijah did not lay hands on him. Elijah did not say, okay, receive the double portion. Elijah did not say, actually, I've been waiting for this. He just dropped, the mantle dropped down. And Elijah recognized when it comes to your time, you will recognize. And then he picked up that mantle, that same mantle that came upon him on the day, the first day he first met Elijah. And he went to the riverside Jordan, where is the Lord God of Elijah? And he smote it, and the river parted here and there. The power of the Lord had come upon Elijah. But you know, after he burnt the bridge behind him and started following after Elijah, what was he doing? Was he given preaching opportunity? Was he given prophetic opportunity? Look at chapter 3, 2 Kings chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 11. 2 Kings chapter 3, we're looking at verse 11. But Jehoshaphat said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord? that we may inquire of the Lord by him and one of the one of the kings of Israel's servants answered and said, Here is Elisha, the son of Shaphat. Tell me. Say it, say, say it aloud. You can do better than that. Which poured water on the hands of Elijah. That's all he was doing when Elijah was alive. And it says he poured water on his hand. I pray you will not miss your calling. You will not miss your opportunity. Elijah, is this all I'm going to be doing? I left my work. All the 12 yoke of oxen, I left everything. And I burnt all those things. And I said bye-bye to my profession. And I am following you. What am I going to do? Time is running out. I'm not getting younger. I'm getting older. Not Elisha. I pray that same attitude of Elisha, the Lord will give unto you in Jesus' name. Levi, L for Levi, E for Epaphras, A for Apollos, D for Daniel, E for Elisha, R for the Rechabites. We're looking at Jeremiah chapter 35. Jeremiah chapter 35. You see, if God is going to use anybody, we must pattern our lives after those men of old, those ministers of old, how God called them, and they went on and on without ever looking back. And whatever commandment they had received from their father in the Lord, they kept on and they obeyed to the letter. Even when their father in the Lord was not there in the physical, Jeremiah chapter 35, 
5, verse 1, the word which came unto Jeremiah from the Lord in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, saying, Go unto the house of the Rechabites and speak unto them and bring them into the house of the Lord, into one of the chambers and give them wine to drink. Then I took Jezaniah, the son of Jeremiah, the son of Abazaniah, and his brethren, and all his sons, and the whole house of the Rechabites. And I brought them into the house of the Lord, into the chamber of the sons of Anan, and the son of Igdaliah, a man of God, which was by the chamber of the princes, which was above the chamber of Mesem, and the son of Shalom, the keeper of the door. And I said before the sons of the house of the Rechabites, pots full of wine, and cups, and I said unto them, drink ye wine, and they said, with all due respect, Jeremiah, with all due respect, prophet, we will drink no wine. For Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father commanded us, saying, Ye shall drink no wine, neither ye nor your sons forever. Forever. The commandment of our father was not temporary. It was to be forever. And even though you're a prophet, Jeremiah, we know you, and we know your qualification, and we know your stature in the kingdom, but we will not drink any wine. What our father has told us, that we're going to keep to. I pray that same commitment of the Rechabites, the Lord will give every one of us in Jesus' name. Look at verse 18. And Jeremiah said unto the house of the Rechabites, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, before, uh, because ye have obeyed the commandment of Jonadab, your father, and kept all his precepts and done according to all that he has commanded you. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Jonadab, the son of Rechab shall not want, shall not lack a man to stand before me. Tell me for how long? Forever. Yes, for Silas. Yes, for Silas. You remember Paul the Apostle in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 15 now, when um, uh, the, 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 the prophets were first sent out, Silas was one of them. In Acts chapter 15, Acts chapter 15, I'm reading from verse 32. And Judas and Silas, being prophets also themselves, prophets also themselves, who could speak to exhortation, who could speak to edification, who could speak to the comfort of the people of God, being prophets also themselves, exhorted the brethren with many words and confirmed them. And after their tarriage there is peace, they were let go in peace from the brethren unto the apostles. Notwithstanding, it pleased Silas to abide there still. It pleased Silas to abide there still. And when Paul the Apostle was to go back in his second missionary journey, and Barnabas had disagreed and was not going to go with him, look at verse 14. And, so, and Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. And now he came to chapter 16. You know what happened there? That uh, when the evil spirit had been cast out of the damsel, Paul and Silas were beaten mercilessly. Chapter 16, verse 19. And when our masters saw that the hope of their gaze was gone, they caught Paul and Silas and drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers. And what happened? They beat them. Verse 23. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, not only upon Paul, upon them, Paul and Silas, 
they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. And uh, Silas did not say, so this is what we are coming to. This is what is going to happen. And if I ever come out of this one, I'll never come again. If I ever get out of this, look at my body. I'm bleeding. And if I ever come out of this, no more. Not Silas. You know, some people, they experience a little challenge. They experience a little difficulty. And they say, you know what? I don't think I'm going to make it next Tuesday. Look at what I went through. And look at what I didn't, you know, I couldn't get home until this time. And that time, well, I'll be, you know, you'll come and tell me whatever uh, they say in the Tuesday meeting. You live near uh, Bagada, and so you will be there. You will, you will tell me, not Silas, not me. I said, not me. You will continue in Jesus' name. They laid many stripes on them, and then look at verse 25, and at midnight... And at midnight, Paul, and tell me the name, Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prison and the prisoners had them. And suddenly, somebody help me shout, suddenly, there was a great earthquake so that the, the foundations of the prison were shaking. And immediately all the doors were open and everyone's bands were loosed. Your bands are loosed. Your bands are taken away. All chains and shackles are taken away from your life in Jesus' name. H is for Habakkuk. H is for Habakkuk. Come to Habakkuk. I'm reading from chapter. I'm reading from chapter two. Habakkuk chapter two. In verse one, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower. I will watch to see what he will say unto me. He was eager to hear the word of God. He was eager to reveal, to receive the revelation of the Lord. If you're a minister and you're following after the pattern, after the lifestyle of these past productive, persistent and persevering leaders, you'll be eager to hear the word of God. What will you say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved and the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon our tables that they may run that read a bit. He said, You're going to have a vision, you're going to have a revelation, and that revelation you write, and the people that receive it, they will run with it in Jesus' name. Look at chapter 3, chapter 3, verse 17. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, that's what Habakkuk said, neither shall the fruit be in the vines, and the labor of the olive shall fail, and the field shall yield no meat the flock shall be cut off from the fold and there shall be no herd in the stalls yet things are negative yet things are down yet the economy is not going well yet i will rejoice in the lord i will joy in the god of my salvation i pray you'll not give up the faith Whatever is happening, your rejoice and the joy of the Lord will be your strength in Jesus' name. We're coming to First Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32. First Chronicles chapter 12, verse 32. And this is talking about Issachar. Issachar. It says in verse 32, and the children of Issachar, which were men that had understanding of the times. You know, if you're a minister of God, the times in which you're ministering, the epoch, the era, the period you're ministering, you need to have understanding of the times. What's going on in your country? What's going on in your community? You must have understanding of the times and to know what Israel ought to do. The understanding you have as a 
leader will make sure to know what the congregation, the Israel of God, what they need to do. The heads of them were 200, uh, were 200 and all their brethren were at their command. You know the brethren, when they know that you have, you, you know what you know, and you know the truth, and you know the way they ought to go, and you have understanding of the times, understanding of the scriptures, understanding of the way of God, they will follow you, and this work will prosper in your hand in Jesus' name. It will prosper in my hand. I said it will prosper in my hand. This work will prosper in your hand. P for Philip. P for Philip. We're coming to Acts chapter 8, and I'm reading from verse 5. P for Philip. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto all those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. And then it says, for, unto, for unclean spirits crying out with loud voice came out of many. And it says, and they, were, uh, they, they, and they that were possessed with evil spirits, and they are many taken with palsies, and that were lame were healed. Your time has come. Power in your ministry. Authority in your ministry. You will not fail. And the anointing will not fail in your life in Jesus' name. And there was great joy in that city. And there will be great joy in your community. And there will be great joy in your field of ministry. You will preach. You will pray. You will deliver the oppressed. You will heal the sick. And the Lord will do great, wonderful things in your life in Jesus' name. Point number three, awakening the spirit of passive leaders. Awakening the spirit of passive leaders. We will wake up. Every one of us will wake up. You will wake up. Anything that is causing drowsiness will be taken away from your life in Jesus' name. Anything that is causing tiredness, I don't know what, I, what happened to me. I don't have the zeal I used to have. I don't have the fervency I used to have. Tonight, 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 you wake up in Jesus' name. Look at Isaiah chapter 52. Isaiah chapter 52, and I'm reading from verse 1. Isaiah chapter 52, verse 1. Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion. Put on the beautiful garment, so Jerusalem, the holy city, for henceforth there shall no more come into thee the uncircumcised and the unclean. Pabency will come. Fire will come. Power will come. Excitement, earnestness will come in Jesus' name. Look at verse to shake thyself from the doors. That is, you'll be lying down there, and because you're lying down there, you're still, all that dust will be upon your clothes, and all the things that go by will be crawling on you. God forbid. I say, God forbid. Shake thyself from the doors, and arise and sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose thyself from the bands of thy neck, O captive daughter of Zion. We are now awakened. I am awakened. The fire of the Holy Ghost in your life in Jesus' name. Now, with being awakened and seeing the leaders that have gone before us, what now am I to do? What now are you to do? El labor more. Labor more. That's how we advance. That's how we move on. That's how, if we are really awakened and we're rising up and we're doing the work now with new strength and new energy, L, love more, labor more, learn more, listen more, E, evangelize more. Evangelize more. Look at all those communities. Now the fire has come. Now the power has come. Evangelize more. A, aspire more. I want to be like those people have heard about. I want to be like the people who are fiery and fervent, and I want to go in the direction of product, productivity, aspire more. D, 
do more and do more you will do more in your life it's not just like the way you were last year that same you'll be like this like that this year things are going to go up you will grow the work in your hand will grow e endure more endure more there might be things that will you know that will come and say ah this year again uh, i thought last year was enough for this to have happened and for that to have happened and this new year 2020 that same thing is still happening yes endure more you will not fail those things will not bring you down endure more are release more release your strength release your energy release your health everything you've got let there be more let there be more let there be more release more s sub more sub more h help more i intercede more p preach more pray more persevere more you are going to reach a higher level am i talking to somebody there what is the person i'm talking about you'll go higher in jesus name you reach higher in Jesus' name, and the work of God will prosper in your hand more than ever before in Jesus' name. Awake, awake, put on thy strength, O Zion. No unclean sin will come in your life anymore. Shake yourself from the doors, and then new power, new strength, new energy will operate in every one of our lives in Jesus' name. I'm ready for more. I said, I'm ready for more. I said, I'm ready for more. Rise up now and tell the Lord, I'm ready. Rise up now and tell the Lord, I'm ready. Rise up now and tell the Lord, I'm ready. I'm ready for more. And the Lord will use you more this year in Jesus' name. Labor more, labor more. Evangelize more. Aspire more. Do more. Endure more. Release more. Serve more. Help more. Intercede more. Pray more, preach more, and progress more. This work must prosper in your hands.